Welcome, everybody. My name is Anne Martin. I'm a principal uh, scientific manager at the Innovative Medicines Initiative. Um, and I'll be briefly into be your moderator this afternoon for the drug and use. When, when you're asking questions afterwards, we will ask you to uh, make sure that you use the microphone. Um, the questions on the application procedure and the rules for that you had the morning session. Uh, there's, I want to remind you about the EMI website as well as the possibility of contacting EMI as well as the boots that are still uh, downstairs. Uh, during the break. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the topic presenters for this afternoon. Jerry Kenna from AstraZeneca and Richard Weaver from Servier. Um, Jerry is respons works for AstraZeneca and he has the leadership of the company's preclinical hepatotoxicity strategy. Uh, that's a cross-functional initiative whose purpose it is to enable design and the selection of drugs with minimized potential for uh, to cause liver injury in humans. His specific primary and in scientific interests are in the mechanisms that underlie idiosyncratic drug reactions. Um, Dr. Kenna received his, his BSc honors and PhD in biochemistry from the universities of Leeds and London, respectively. Dr. Richard Weaver, he is um, graduated in biochemistry and toxicology, and he's the director of bioanalysis and new, technolo new technologies division at the Drug Safety Center for Servier in France. Um, he's worked in several collaborative um, partnerships, and uh, he has a series of peer-reviewed articles and, and book chapters uh, to which he contributed. Um, I want to remind you that there will be the webinar on the 4th of November between 10 and 12 in the morning Brussels time. Um, the instructions on how you could invite further colleagues, eventually partners that you envisage, um, how to, the instructions uh, will be on the website. So during that webinar, the topic presentation will be repeated, and at that time you will be able to ask questions via a chat function. So this is to further enable for the people that were not able to come today. Um, just a few quick reminders, uh, so that it's really <coughs> ingrained in your mind and that these things become easier. Um, for EMI to be able to actually consider your application, it is necessary that all the sections in the expression of interest templates are addressed. That is the scientific technological case, the partnership case, the summary work plan, and the ethical issues. And for that, we all this is happening on an electronic tool. And the one uh, thing that you absolutely cannot forget is to actually finalize your application by pressing the finalize button. So. I already warn you about that right now. Um, you are always able to reopen it, but if you want it to be submitted, then you have to finalize it. Um, of course, very carefully read the top, uh, topic text again. Make sure that all the scientific objectives are addressed. The work packages themselves, the given structure is flexible and allows for other project design proposals uh, as you deem them best. The participants are expected to make key contributions on the defined deliverables in synergy with the contributions of the FPR consortium or what they indicate that they can contrib contribute to and what the kinds of in-kind um, contributions that they think they will be making. The FPR contribution is in kind, and uh, as earlier said this morning, that tends to be refined during the full, uh, whilst uh, a full project proposal is, is prepared. Here is my email address uh, in case you have further questions. And we also have an info desk where <coughs> you can leave your questions 
typically, if it's questions on the topic, it's best to come straight to me. If it's uh, general questions about the application procedure, go to the info desk because then uh, multiple people can actually address your question in sometimes a much more precise way than I am able to do so. Uh, and here also I remind you of uh, the website link and uh, the link towards the partner search tool, um, which, which may give further ideas on uh, potential partners that you may be able to contact. So, um, I don't know who, I know that, yeah, Jerry is, is going to present. So, I, I'll uh, give the word to Dr. Jerry Kenner. Thank you very much, Anne. I'm very pleased to, to see some people here to hear about this topic. I have been leading the FPA Cross Pharma Group that's been preparing this call, and I will s state right now that I have a, a very strong personal interest in this. I've been told that my primary responsibility within my organization for the next five years will be delivering a program of work, this program of work, so this will happen and it will need to deliver and be successful. So I'm 100% committed to that. A lot of work is happening to define, from an FPA perspective, what we think the issues are and what we think a reasonable approach could be to this challenge. Uh, we appreciate that this is our view of the world and the tremendous strength of IMI is that it gives us an opportunity to work between companies and it gives us an opportunity to work with the academic community, SME, other providers, regulatory agencies, the like. Clearly for drug-induced liver injury, we are not gonna solve this problem working in isolation. We're going to have to collaborate and we are going to collaborate. So please view this as the start of that collaborative process moving onwards. We are very much looking for some strong bids coming in and we're very much um, looking forward to working with the, the winning selected consortium from the beginning of next year onwards to define a program of work and deliver a program of work and really deliver a step change in how we tackle drug-induced liver injury. The current situation is unacceptable. We need to do much better and this program of work will be a major part of how the FPA partners transform their approach to prediction and avoidance of drug-induced liver injury in man. So, you're all familiar with varying extents of the background to this. In our view, it's very much a pre-competitive issue. We know that drug-induced liver injury in man has been a major cause of, of withdrawal of numerous drugs a major cause of cautionary label and restricted usage of licensed drugs, and a major cause of illness in the human population. So this is affecting everybody who is in the human population and has to take drugs for therapeutic use, and it's also affecting the competitiveness of uh, pharmaceutical organizations across Europe and across the whole of the world. So this is a massive issue, which isn't just one for pharmaceutical companies, and it's certainly not one for any individual pharmaceutical company. Individual pharmaceutical companies have tried to tackle this in isolation in the past. That has failed, so we are committed to working pre-competitively. We've tried to tackle this in collaboration with academic groups in the past. That's been partially successful, but we think IMI gives us a much better chance of delivering in the future because it gives the FPA partners an opportunity to get together and define common ground and it gives academics a chance to get together, define common ground and work on a joint program of work. We believe that there are many very exciting advances coming through in the scientific community and our understanding of mechanisms of drug-induced liver injury and the basis of human susceptibility is being transformed and there are some big step change uh, uh, examples of progress being made. For example, I think the most recent one is, is a clear association of, of HLA haplotypes with susceptibility to flucloxacillin associated, li associated liver injury. This is a breaking area, there's emerging uh, knowledge, there's emerging tools. We're aware that there's some very exciting new experimental model systems coming forward. Some of them are in vitro based model systems with stem cell derived material having enormous potential. Some of them uh, are new creative in vivo models. There's, there's a real opportunity to, to apply this new thinking and this needs to be tackled in a pre-competitive fashion. In order to 
move in this area, we have to find some way to funnel down a large number of opportunities to a manageable, tractable program of work. So what we are going to be committed to doing in this program of work is prioritizing opportunities, evaluating uh, newly def defined opportunities pre-competitively, and ultimately coming up with new defined ways of working more effectively within the timescale of the program. So we are giving ourselves a hard deliverable. By the end of the five years, we want a set of best practice guidelines that indicate how we work with current technology, which will be the first part of the step change, the radical change uh, for how we will approach drug-induced liver injury within my pharmaceutical companies. I've touched already on, on why we need a public-private uh, consortium. This reiterates the points. We believe that academic groups have been severely restricted by the fact that many of the most useful reference compounds that cause drug-induced liver injury in man are compounds that fail in clinical trials. Pharmaceutical companies identify those compounds, dump them, forget about it, and try and ignore that that issue ever happened. We've all been guilty of it within pharmaceutical companies. And it's the companies that, it's the, the compounds that fail in clinical trials that are especially advantageous moving onwards. So we need to find a way to uh, give access of, of academic groups to those compounds. We also need to find a way to give academic groups access to the technological muscle and, and the scale-up potential that's available within pharmaceutical companies. We've got very expensive kit, we've got very expensive high volume, high throughput capability. We need to be applying it intelligently and working with uh, academic partners to, to define new technologies and, and refine new technologies as we go forward. Within pharmaceutical companies, the science is too complicated for us to, to tackle in isolation. We're not the best academics in this field, and the best academics in this field are in various places. So we, we have to put all that together. We, we will need to define a clear sense of purpose and all buy into a plan which takes a very, very complex area of science and reduces it down to a manageable project plan. And the public-private cons consortium collaboration arrangement gives us an opportunity to do that. So in the background text, you'll see that we've tried to identify very clearly what we see are the objectives of, of the project. And we have a primary goal, which is above and beyond everything else, something that we must deliver in the course of this work, in, as indicated on this slide. The, the goal is to identify new assays and models that we can use on a daily basis within drug discovery and early non-clinical drug development to enable us to design, rank and select candidates that can progress into clinical phases that have the low uh, potential to cause drug-induced liver injury in the human population. We are really committed to taking forward approaches that improve our ability to select non-apatotoxic drugs. And we will be testing our models to ask, are they actually working in practice? Within the timescale of, of um, an IMI program, actually five years isn't very long to assess value, but if we have promising candidate drugs within the first three years and we start to apply them uh, within a drug development timescale, it might even be possible to, to find out whether we're starting to make a difference. In actual fact, we're probably not going to know about how successful we've really been at improving the quality of our drug development pipeline until after this program. So, this program we view as a starting point, not uh, the only work we will do in this area. The most important thing in order to be able to influence compound design and compound ranking and compound selection is in vitro approaches, because we use in vitro approaches routinely as part of our drug discovery paradigm, because that gives us an opportunity to test many, many different compounds. And we're very much committed to the goals of three R's, replacement, refinement, um, avoidance, if at all possible, of um, in vivo preclinical safety testing assessment model systems, and in vitro matches up perfectly with a key goal of three R's. So this is the major objective of what we want to achieve. We want in vitro approaches that we can use routinely with best practice guidance as part of our drug discovery and early safety assessment cascades. We have supportive goals because in order to deliver on that primary goal, we need to do more than just focus on in vitro methodologies. 